there are times like today when really it makes absolutely no sense to be doing what I'm doing. You know, taking the time to stop my life and to take on His will for my life. Because you see, if I take care of my life, I'd be in the shower right now taking care of myself. You know, just kind of like getting all cleaned up and getting all presentable and getting all straightened up and, you know, fixed up and going about my business, you know, doing the things that I want to do. But I gave up my rights to my life when I got saved. Now, maybe you didn't. You know, maybe you have a different kind of relationship with God. And maybe Jesus is your Savior, not your Lord yet, but maybe He's your Lord and you become your friend and you've got a whole different kind of life, life that you live. But the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the will of the Son of God who died for me and gave Himself for me. So I don't always get to do my will, although at times I go against His will and I rebel against what He's told me to do. And I choose to do other things. But when I do that, I suffer the consequences of my own choice and actions that I prefer to do His will, not my will, be done. See what I mean? So, when I started Vivo, I kind of, you know, God wanted me to be real and be open and sincere and honest. And, you know, when it got popular and got, you know, huge, I kind of went off on tangents at times, you know, going, wow, this is cool, Lord. And God kept saying to me, look, I understand, I'll, don't, don't misunderstand me. I will bless you, but still do my will. So, there are times when I don't want to do His will. I don't want to do the things He said to do. I don't want to, you know, get up in, in 110 degree weather, you know, work on computers and do all these things that, you know, encourage other people or maybe explain how God deals with life in general by being personal, intimate, and real with each and every one of us in every situation of our life that there's absolutely nothing that we can't take to God and find the answers for. Now let me be clear about that. There is absolutely, that means everything, nothing, that means nothing, that can't be taken to God to find out His will for our lives. Because you see, in the midst of when Jesus should have been trying to rescue Himself from what was going to happen, He chose not His will, but the Father's will be done. Because He knew from the beginning where He was going. And He knew that He was going to be persecuted, beaten, tortured, and died. And He knew He would be resurrected again. And He knew that this would all be accomplished for the glory of God His Father. I don't know if the Gospel was ever presented to you in that way, but Jesus was pretty blunt when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that you will be put into situations you don't want to do them. You will be challenged to become something you at times might rebel against, you know, and your flesh might be going, uh-uh, I want my cake and eat it too. And God is saying, give it up. Get rid of it. It's poison. It's killing you. And you'll be kind of like all your life struggling and fighting, not with other Christians, although that may happen at times, not with the world and its ways, although that may happen at times. The battle really is you. It'll be you fighting you. Because you see, there's a new you inside. That's the person who's become not born of the flesh, but born of the spirit. But also, you've already been born, obviously, because I'm talking to you, of the flesh. So you still have this carnal nature and attitude and reactions and actions and all this kind of stuff that's got a head start on who you are as a born-again Christian that's really kind of like a born-again Satanist, you know, I mean, that's what your flesh is. It's really wanting selfish desires and seeking itself and to elevate itself and to do all these evil things in the sight of God. Even though you may call them good, God says, uh-uh. He says, that which is good is the spirit of truth. That which is flesh, no, I'm sorry, it's corrupted. Everything it touches is corrupted. Everything it goes after is corrupted. As a matter of fact, it's just corrupted. So I'm going to have to crucify that flesh. No offense to you. You know, I know you like your flesh, and I know you've been 
decorating it, painting it, getting it all cleaned up, and you know, like tucking it and ch chucking it, and you know, like moving it around and taking it off here and putting it over there and kind of like moving it around. But when I look at it, it's corruption. All of it. All of your flesh and all of your your brainstorming, barnstorming, painting it, looking at it so magnificent and wonderful. Eh, I'm God. I don't see it so good. But when I look at your heart, ah. Then I see where I need to start because your heart is really dark. So I need to go in there and clean it up, you know, change it. So you have your flesh on the outside that you're working on. God has your heart that he's working on. And the two are working against each other most of the time. Now you could help God on the outside by reading the word and putting it on the inside. So you start from the outside and it comes through your eyes, it goes on the inside and it kind of helps God accomplish what he's trying to do in you. But he's not trying to save the outer you. Because the outer you is pretty messed up. So every time if you notice that you try to do something for God, without God, it gets pretty messed up. But if you work with God on the outside, doing what he says to do, it seems to be accomplished. So. There are days when you're going to feel like you're really kind of a schizophrenic, you know, kind of like, man, fighting a battle that you don't even understand the warfare rules. You know, it's kind of like, well, I don't get it. I'm just not making progress here. Well, maybe you aren't, but God is. Maybe you haven't figured out that the battle isn't out there, but the battle is in here. The battle is in your heart where you need to yield your will and intellect, your mind and your time to God. You need to learn to not be just a born-again baby, you know, sucking your thumb and taking it all in and saying, I'm the one, you know, and it's always me, me, I, I, and everything is accomplished for me and to me, and I'm being blessed, and God bless me, and I worship God, you know. But when you grow up, when you get over yourself, when you deny yourself and take up your cross, like Jesus said, then you become like a disciple. You begin to grow up into, it's about them. It's about someone else. It's about helping others as opposed to helping yourself. Because everyone knows who's at the party helping themselves. You can always tell. They got a plate and they're just pouring on the food, you know. Even though the Bible says, don't be a man of appetite. Take a little bit, but don't take the king's dainties. Take a little portions, you know. Lest you become a man of appetite, you know, and you indulge yourself and become fat and slowly. You know, kind of like most Americans today. You know, they become obese because they said, hey, God blessed us, so we're going to enjoy it. And sure enough, America enjoyed it until God brought climate change. Oops! Americans enjoyed it until God hit us in the breadbasket. Oops! Americans enjoyed it until God hit us in our financial pocket. Oops! And then we began to say, um, God, help. Oh, I got your attention. Okay. So you see, it's not how you feel or what you want, but it's what He wants and how He feels. You see, the way God feels about you is He loves you. Really. He loves you. He loves you so much that He's not going to leave you the way you are, you know, all dirty and messed up, you know, kind of like... You know, little kids, you know, when they jump in a mud pool, you know. Have you ever been one of those little kids, you know, where you, you couldn't afford to go to the, you know, public swimming pool, you know. You couldn't afford to get something from the neighborhood, you know, but you had to go out. And so when you were a little kid, you dug this big old hole, you know, and you got your little shovel and you dug a hole. And you filled it up full of water, and, you know, you could see what's coming. And then you dove in, and you were all muddy, but you had fun because you were splashing around in it, and you had a blast. And you went and showed your mom, you know, and she kind of like, you know, like, grabbed you by the ear, you know, and marched you off to the bathroom, you know, and you had to get in the shower and get all cleaned up. Well, that's kind of what God has to do sometimes with you. Because you get involved in all these other things that really is you digging a hole, digging a pit, filling it full of water and saying, oh, well, this is, this is Christianity. This is my religion. And so you dove in, and unfortunately God looked at it and went, what? What are you talking about? You come here. I want to show you what's true. And so he has to take you by the ear, drag you off to the shower, and clean you up with the Word of God. He has to wash away all your efforts and all your ideas about what you think Christianity is because you dug the hole. It's true. And you didn't fall into the pit because you filled it up full of the Word of God and tried to make it seem like it was a swimming pool. I'm sorry. 
that ain't it. Whenever you do it your way, as opposed to his way, you're going to find the old swimming pool isn't some river of life that's coming directly from God, you know, which is pure and washing people around you, but you're going to find that you're splashing mud on everybody. You're throwing all kinds of dirt, you know, on everyone. You know, kind of like what people are doing in their political thing. You know, they say they're Christians, and yet they badmouth the president, or they badmouth Christianity, or they point fingers at each other, or they just throw a lot of mud around. You know, it's kind of like they've been swimming in their own swimming hole. You know, and that's what seems to happen. God looks down and says, look, you're not doing my will. You're not loving like I said to love. You're not doing my will. And this is my will, that you should love one another as I have loved you. So who did Jesus not love? I mean, if he died for everybody, what are we doing throwing mud and dirt on everybody? Isn't it time to get out of that mud hole and get into the swimming pool? I don't know about you, but I kind of like it when God designs this huge sea of glass that's tranquil. And all those that go in it come out of it refreshed and blessed. And that all of their past is removed and their sin is cast as far away from them as the seas. And that all of my failings and all of my failures are cast into the sea of forgetfulness. And no longer are they remembered anymore. I like that kind of swimming. I'm ready to go die. Because you know what? When I start thinking about, you know, like, my own failures, ooh, when I think of my failures, I'm doing a backstroke. But you know, when I think about God's successes, I'm moving forward. I'm heading in the right direction. You know what? When I'm doing it my way, I'm kind of like dog paddling. You know, because that's what really I'm doing. When I do it my way, I'm dog paddling, just barely floating. Unless you really turn your life over to God and let Him lead you, you're just fooling yourself into jumping into a pit filled full of water. It may be the Word of God, you know, but you filled it full of water and Unfortunately, it's got so much of the world in it that you wound up making a mud hole, not a swimming pool. So can I make a suggestion? Ask God what you're swimming in. Because you might be swimming in <laughs> the wrong kind of water. <laughs> it might be a cesspool and as soon as somebody flushes, <laughs> guess what? You'll be flushed out to the sea. Now a cesspool unfortunately it doesn't have, you know, kind of like that drain off. It just slowly filters out into the land, you know, kind of stinks up everything. But a sewer, you know, it flushes it out. I don't want you to be in the sewer and I don't want you to be in the cesspool. I'd rather you were in the Word of God, you know, listening to what He has to say to you today. And for me, yeah, there are some days, you know, I don't feel like coming out here and kind of like, you know, talking about God. There's some days that I think, you know, what in the world am I doing? But you know what? Even when I don't feel like it, God feels like it. And God moves in my heart as I open my mouth to share the love that He has for each and every one of us. That, man, I realized, wow, as I was helping someone else, He was helping me. And as I was sharing with someone else, He was changing me. So I kind of like that. You know, it's like I share with people and He shares with me. I kind of get blessed. It's almost as though a reverse narcissism. You know, kind of like I'm watching God working in me outward to someone else so that I could get that inward so that he would work on me. You could be selfish that way. Kind of interesting way I'm looking at it, but let's be real. After all, you are the most important person you know, right? Or are you? You'll figure that one out. Won't you?